My name is Jorge Gerisati. I am the president of Venezuelan Alliance. And what we're doing is that we're trying to create awareness about the situation in Venezuela. And I think at the same time that we will also raise awareness about the importance of free and democratic institutions. So I think that's one of the, one of the duties that we have as Venezuelans. It's not only free our country, but at the same time, I think we need to share our lessons to the world. The world needs to understand what happened in Venezuela so we don't have other Venezuelans. So other countries don't fall into the same human misery that we are seeing in Venezuela right now. Mm -hmm. How is the situation right now in Venezuela? Well, the situation is, is critical. It's critical as you have right now hyperinflation, 10 million percent. You have 90% of the people in poverty, 60% in extreme poverty. You have really the entire population uh, cannot afford to have 700 calories per day. The entire population is trying to find food on the garbage because the policies of this regime and the previous administration has implemented severe conditions towards and hardship towards the Venezuelan economy. So the situation is critical in the economic front, in the political front as well. We don't have human rights, we don't have civil rights in Venezuela. Venezuela, there is a massive dictatorship that is incarcerating students, dissidents, political activists. So the situation is very critical right now. Mm, let's go a little bit back to history. Uh, how does it start when Chavez um, came in power? In which sense? How does it start? I mean, I mean, I mean, Chavez came in power, and then what? What changed in Venezuela? So in Venezuela, basically, when Chavez took power, there was a reshape of the entire institutional framework in the political and the economic institutions. In terms of economic institutions, for example, Chavez started controlling more and more the economy, trying to impose price caps, nationalizations, expropriations uh, in all industries, in banking, agriculture, etc. So, and in the political sphere, Chavez started centralizing power to the executive branch. So, basically, in Venezuela, what we saw is what we saw, for example, in the Soviet Union, that uh, the political party, the charismatic leader, and the state became the same. And that's extremely harmful for a democracy. Uh, if we believe in liberal democracy, we believe in division of powers. If we believe in, the, in liberal democracy, we believe in a, in a, in a government that, that provides public goods without discrimination. And in Venezuela, we don't have it for years. So in the political sphere, Chavez started centralizing power, step by step. Uh, you don't lose your freedom from one day to the next. It's a process. And he started centralizing power. He tried, he tried, he started uh, making the politicization of all institutions, uh, from the, the oil company to the central bank to the judiciary system. So when you have that, then you start having an state that has too much power, or start consuming civil society. So that happened, and also the economic controls. So you start seeing how Venezuela start deteriorating to a tyranny. That is what is right now, because right now, you have 40,000 violent murders per year in Venezuela. You have 5 million people who have fled the nation. You have hyperinflation. You have a huge humanitarian crisis. So Venezuela is right now uh, in really, really collapsing in all fronts. And that's why we need to make a change. And not only for Venezuela, but for the region in general. We cannot have a failed state in the middle of the continent, of the American continent, with a migratory crisis only comparable to the Syrian refugee crisis. We cannot have that. So basically, Venezuela is in a state of collapse that we need to change right now. And the only way to do it is with a political transition. We have a clear roadmap in Venezuela. We need to, we need to stop the usurpation of power in Venezuela. We need to have an interim government, and we need to have free and fair elections. And if we do that, then we can start tackling the economic hardship with our national plan, or national economic plan, that I believe that we can bring prosperity to Venezuela, rule of law to Venezuela, and stability to Venezuela again. Mm -hmm. Um, let's talk about the development after Chavez. So Maduro took power. Uh, what changed then? So, so first of all, let's go to the Chavez administration. All this horrible economic policy of more control to the private sector for political purposes, which is extremely important to remember. When they control the economy, it's for political reasons. For instance, if you control the currency change, you control import and export. So you control a huge part of the economy, therefore you control politically that part of the economy. So then when, when Maduro took power in 2013, then Maduro inherited those bad economic policies and he deepened those economic policies. So from 2013 to up to date, the Venezuelan economy GDP has lost 60% of its value. To put in comparison to, for example, the US Great Depression, in the Great Depression, the U.S. lost 25% of GDP. So this is more than twice, exactly. 
Same with the, with the Greek crisis, same with the Spanish Civil War. So it's the worst economic uh, uh, collapse in the history of the modern history of the human, uh, of the Western Hemisphere. So, so Venezuela right now is collapsing because of the policies of, of, of Chavez and then Maduro. But in these five years, for example, the minimum wage has lost 97% of its value. Imagine that. And that's why Venezuela's minimum wage is $6 per month. You can only buy 700 calories per day with that. And that's why Venezuelans are losing weight like no other country. So Maduro started trying repressing the financial sector a lot. He started imposing even more price caps in 2013. And his way of handling the political crisis of Venezuela has also incremented the risk of Venezuela, of, of, for example, or international risk of, of to creditors, for instance. So the administration of Maduro has been the worst administration in the history of Venezuela, by far. And on top of that, he inherited a government like the Chavez government that was a wasted opportunity for Venezuela. During the Chavez administration from 1998 to 2013, Venezuela received $1 trillion in oil revenues. And in those years, Venezuela underperformed the region in terms of GDP per capita growth. And in terms of uh, losing and inequality, Venezuela was even more this inequal during that time. So Chavez was a wasted opportunity in all fronts of the world, and Maduro was even worse. Mm -hmm. uh, let's talk about the influence of other countries in Venezuela. What's the influence of Cuba, for example? Cuba is the country that, without a doubt, has the much, much influence in Venezuela. Uh, for ideological reasons, for interest, economic interests as well, and, and, and for reasons that, that are hard to imagine, how a tiny island has so much power in a country like Venezuela. And in, for some of the military, Cubans are in the Venezuelan military. Cubans control the election process in Venezuela. That's why we don't have free and fair elections. Uh, for instance, something that, that we need to say again is that Juan Guaidó is the president of Venezuela, is because of the constitution's demand to. Last year, we were supposed to have presidential elections. And because Nicolás Maduro did not want to go to elections because he knows that he doesn't have the people with him, then according to Article 230 of our constitution, Guaidó was the legitimate president of Venezuela. But why we didn't have elections last year? Because Maduro and the Cubans know that they don't have the majority of people with them. They don't have the political capital to do that. So. So the Cubans had a ton of influence. And, and something that I, that, I, that I said, for example, yesterday in my conference, and I will say again right now, is that when Venezuela is free, I think will happen something similar to the fall of the Berlin Wall. And I think when Venezuela is free, I think the entire continent can be free. And dictatorships such as, such as the Cuban dictatorship and the Nicaraguan dictatorship will fall after the fall of the Venezuelan dictatorship. Uh, you mentioned um, how can it be that a small, so small island has so much influence. Could you describe it a little bit more? How, how is it possible? What's the deal? I mean, what is Cuba getting out of it? Why, why, why do they have so much power? Well, Cuba, through the diplomatic mechanism, has had a ton of influence in the region. Not only for ideological uh, sense of the world, but also for diplomatic and strategic reasons. And in Venezuela, particularly, they control the identification of people in Venezuela. They control parts of the military. They control the electoral system. But how did the Chavez government allow that? And that's why I think Chavez was extremely anti-patriotic, anti-Venezuelan. It's because of that, because he allowed another country to intervene into the Venezuelan economy, into the Venezuelan political institutions. And that's why, for example, when everyone is right now talking about the United States possible intervention in Venezuela, why no one is talking about the Cubans and the Russian intervention in Venezuela? Right. Why no one is talking about that? And that's extremely important, because right now you have Russians refining oil in Venezuela. You have Cubans for years taking oil for free from Venezuela. That's intervention. That's interference with our sovereignty. And me as a Venezuelan, I don't want to have, I don't want to have Cubans in my military. I don't, want to, I don't want to have Cubans in my institutions. I want to have Venezuelans. And I think that's something that we need to talk about. When we talk about intervention, why do you have Russia intervening in other countries, like Venezuela, for instance? Why do you have that? That's a question that we need to ask uh, at the international level, because it's a level of stability in our region. If you have countries like Russia, China, and Cuba intervening in our region, then it can be destabilized. Uh -huh. um. 
Okay, how, how is the influence of Russia? I mean, you mentioned Russia. Um, I mean, Cuba has a really big influence. Is it because they are backed still by Russia or? No, the, 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 the Russia influence and the Cuban influence are not the same one, are a different one. For example, the Russian influence is much more in the geopolitical aspect of it. For instance, Chavez, the, the former president of Venezuela, for those that don't know, Chavez was someone that wanted to build like a new international order with these countries that were not aligned with the US, Iran, uh, maybe Turkey in some sense, Iraq, uh, Russia, uh, Belarus. So they were trying to build this non-aligned international order against the US and Russia is of course a, a big player on that. So the support to, from Russia to the Maduro regime and the former Chavez regime was because of that. They both had the same interest at the international perspective. With Cuba, it's more about financial dependency as well. Cuba in the 90s were having a really tough economic situation and after the, as the Chavez rose to power, we started giving away oil. So that gave oxygen to the Cuban dictatorship as well. So that's why we need to separate the two. With China, it's, it's a merely financial um, influence. We have we, we own a ton of money to, to, the, to the Chinese government, so they have interests and incentives to protect the Maduro regime. But I think the biggest problem right now is by far Cuba. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned right now countries. What about people supporting socialism and Chavism? Uh, I would call them like socialist pilgrims. What, what would you tell people like from the left in the Western countries? You mean, for example, in the US? Yeah, like, what would you say to Bernie Sanders or like AOC? I will, I will not directly talk about Ber talk to Bernie Sanders. I will talk to the people that believe in Bernie Sanders, for instance, or to talk or to believe in AOC. If you care about about the people that are need us the most, if you care about the poorest people in society, if you care about those people that cannot pay rent today, if you care about them, let's try to find a solution to that. And the solution is not more socialism. The solution is not more state. The solution is not more welfare. If you believe in them, if you believe in them, you should not subsidize them. You should give them the opportunity so they can be free. You should give them the opportunity so they can be productive. And the only way for me to eradicate poverty out of this world and to try to make a more equal world, a more wealthy world, a world in which everyone can go and have education, healthcare, if you want that, then let's talk about the ideas of economic freedom and political liberty, and in general, the ideas of liberal democracy. What does that mean? What does liberal democracy mean? Liberal democracy is to have a political system in which you have political rights to elect your leaders. You have economic rights, so you can grow your personal activities and to grow your, your spirit of entrepreneurship. And you also have civil rights, and civil rights means the non-discriminatory provision of public goods, such as collective security, such as the judiciary, such as healthcare. But if you want to do that, you cannot believe in communism, you cannot believe in socialism, you must believe in liberal democracy, you must believe in a free economy. And that's why, for those people that, for example, feel represented by Bernie Sanders, I would tell them, let's, let's talk about the issues, and let's see which solutions can we provide and which public policies can we provide, but I'm sure, because the entire empirical data shows that, that is not with socialism. It's with a free economy, it's with a political system that, that encourages an open society, and it's with those institutions that we can eradicate poverty, as the Western society has done. Not following the Venezuelan example, but following the examples of countries that have become prosperous. You mentioned the Venezuela example. Uh, ten years ago, like everybody from the left parties in the whole world said uh, Venezuela is the best example of the, how they call it, uh, democratic socialism of the 21st century. Uh, five years ago, they said, ah, it's maybe not going so good. And today they say, it, they, they always say, ah, it's not real socialism. What would you say to them? Is that, is that, is that again, for example, even now you have people defending what is happening in Venezuela. People defending Maduro or defending the legacy of Chavez. When you hear, when you hear them, you understand that for them, it's not about the reality, it's about an ideology. And they're blind by their ideology. And I think the only thing that they can create is more poverty. I think those that really care about the issues need to see the reality of the situation, need to see which policies led to this reality, 
So we never make the same mistakes. For those that even now are still talking about how good the socialist system of Chavez was, they're just ideological and they, they are blinded by the reality that the, the way and the political system and the economic system implemented in Venezuela really produce these horrible results in Venezuela. Venezuela is right now struggling and Venezuela is right now in this horrible condition, not because of other reasons, such as, for example, declining oil or other or mismanagement of the economy. It's not because of that. It's because of policy. It's because of ideology. It's because of a government that systematically attacked the private property, systematically attacked um, the right to set prices, the right to own a business, the right to, to prosper. It had systematically attacked that. And, and I think those people that still defend a system that is only producing more misery and more poverty, there are really a bunch of elitist, maybe academic or elitist politicians, blindness by ideology that do not care about the people because they're not suffering. Uh, let's talk about uh, some, some myths, I would call it. Many people in the Western world, I mean, the left says, yeah, it's because of the intervention, no, not the interventions about the uh, sanctions of the US. That's, that's why Venezuela has a problem. What could you say to them? So, for instance, the, the sanctions uh, from the US to Venezuela has been implemented since the end of 2015. And in Venezuela, we have been in a recession since 2013. So the empirical data do not show that it's not the sanctions. And the sanctions has been towards the regime, their financial accounts, their ability to transfer money from the state to their private accounts. So it has not been sanctions toward the economy per se. Those that are sanctioning the Venezuelan economy are the same people in government, in the Venezuelan government. And, and for those people that believe there is the sanctions, uh, they're completely wrong. The empirical data do not show that. And th 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 there's no possibility that that's the case. Yeah. Um, th uh, another story is, I would call it a story, is um, the oil price is right now so low, and that's why Venezuela has a, has a problem. Again, this is, it's false. The oil has started collapsing since the third quarter of 2014, and Venezuela started collapsing since 2013. And again, I said collapse in a very light manner because oil has been spiking again. But Venezuela is more and more collapsing. And, and, and again, since the, in the Chavez administration, there's something interesting. Chavez was elected in 1998 in the week that historically oil was at the lowest price in history. Chavez was elected that day. Then 10 years after, oil was per barrel at $140, the highest in the history of humankind. During those years, we received more than $1 trillion in oil revenue, plus $200,000, million dollars in debt, in international debt. So that amount of windfall we never had before, and this is a wasted opportunity by policies. So, if, and right now, for instance, because of mismanagement of the oil industry, right now we are producing 600,000 barrels per day. In 1998, we used to produce three and a half million. Why? Because when you, Chavez, for example, in 2002, fired 200,000 engineers and they put politicians to run oil industry. What will happen? Everything that you are seeing right now. An oil industry devastated that we will need to rebuild in the future. So the only ones that are, that are really shooting their own food is the government. By destroying their industries, by destroying the private sector, and by destroying everything that was making Venezuela productive. The reason that Venezuela is right now in this misery is because they implemented policies that destroyed the private sector almost entirely, and the oil sector that was a sector that was really thriving and that was really growing, they destroyed as well. Um, let's go to the actual business, I would call it. What happened in 2019 when Guaido showed up or was elected as a president by constitution? Yeah. Guaido was elected president by the constitution. In this regard, the constitution demands the president of the National Assembly to become the interim president of Venezuela and then call for free election and fair elections. The problem is that in Venezuela, with the current electoral system, we cannot have that. With the, also, with the current judiciary system that has many political prisoners. And so Guaido, what he's trying to do is that what he's trying to restore the rule of law in Venezuela. 
And right now, the only thing that is impeding that, the, the stopping that, is the military. Right now, what we are asking to the military, we're asking the military members that, that they need to go to the side of the Constitution, that they need to unify with us, that they need to go and really be, really, really understand their role in this historical moment. They need to really pay attention to the Constitution and they need to stop being the oxygen of Nicolás Maduro. If they do that, then our roadmap is simple. Let's go to a transition government and then let's have fair and free elections with international observancy, elections without political prisoners, elections in which the witnesses of the polls are not prosecuted, elections in which political activism can be done in every university, can be done in any street, elections in which there is no prosecution from the government to authorities, elections in which the, the, you can be in media, elections in which you can, you can talk to the people directly in the poorest communities of our society, elections can be transparent. And in Venezuela right now, we don't have that. And we have, done, we have not had that in the last 10 years. So right now, this is a roadmap. And that right now, what we're trying to do is that we're trying to convince the international organic community and, and domestically that we need to make a change. And that we need to make a change this year until it's too late and we need to, until we need to prevent even more human suffering, uh, which is what is happening in Venezuela. Um, let's talk about the, um, the things what happened in 2019 as well. There were really big demonstrations uh, again um, at the beginning of the year from Guaido. So what happened there? Let's start at the beginning. At the beginning of the year, the vast majority of Venezuelans su support, but were supporting Juan Guaido because they knew that Juan Guaido was the legitimate president of our country. So you saw millions of people going to the streets in support of Juan Guaido. And right now, in the latest polls, Guaido has more than 90% of people supporting him, while Maduro has less than 7%. That's a big difference. The people have spoken. If you believe in democracy, you believe in the opportunity to elect all leaders, and people do not want Maduro. Who will want Maduro? Maduro represents misery. Maduro represents violence. Maduro represents the worst of any government. So, so the people, the thing with the people is that the people want to elect their leaders. But right now, Maduro and the crooks are stopping that. And that's right now the fight that we have, how we can make a transition, how we can make a transition that assures and guarantees governability, rule of law, and peace. Because right now, we are committed to have a constitutional, peaceful, and democratic transition in Venezuela, a transition that enables us to rebuild our economy, enables us to rebuild and reshape our, our institutions again, and a transition, a transition that guarantees that the poorest people in our society can live better off tomorrow, and that we stop the humanitarian help, uh, humanitarian aid, uh, humanitarian crisis right now. Uh, you just mentioned human, humanitarian aid. Uh, what happened during this life aid event, you know, yeah. when, when they tried to bring um, humanitarian help over the border? Well, basically we saw the worst of the regime that day because we were trying to bring humanitarian help that will help more than 20,000 people uh, with medicine, etc. And the Maduro regime just stopped that and they burned that. They burned the humanitarian aid that were supposed to help people that have diseases, people that are in hospitals. So you saw what is the Maduro regime is about. It's about destruction, it's about controlling the economy, it's about controlling the country. And and what we're trying to do with humanitarian aid is to, is to help those that need us, those that, that they cannot wait a week. You have, for example, families that, you have a family member, a grandfather, for instance, that, have, that need to have dialysis or that they have cancer. They cannot wait until tomorrow. So what we're trying to do, we're trying to help them, even though we're not in government yet. What is Maduro doing? Blocking humanitarian aid. Like, like, like no government I think before was capable of doing something like that. Stopping help for their own people is simply too much. Uh, then uh, another thing happened. Uh, I think you call it uh, Venezuela sin, sin luz, is that correct? Mm -hmm. uh, Venezuela without electricity. Yes. So what happened there? Well, basically in Venezuela we saw this year, and we have seen throughout this year, is that people, people don't have electricity for three, four, five days in a row. Uh, for example, this started in February, in March, is that people start you know, having electricity for most of the day. And even though, even, even, even right now, 
via sectors in Venezuela that spend only three or four hours per day with electricity. So imagine if you don't have electricity, your food gets spoiled. If you don't have electricity, you cannot open your business because there is no debit card, credit card. If you don't have electricity, you don't have running water in your house. And if you don't have electricity, everything shuts down, basically. So Venezuela is at the verge of the collapse because of this as well. And, and this is something that really concerns me because imagine entire communities without water for four or five days. How can they manage that? How can they, they overcome that? It's difficult. So we're trying to also organize communities so they can help each other in this difficult situation. And for instance, if someone has, um, someone has like a kitchen with gas, let's try to cook all the food because it gets it before it gets spoiled. Uh, if someone has a, like a power bank for, for, for the house, let's try to find a way so that everyone can be there. Uh, but in the imagine it's extremely challenging. And for example, someone that is, for example, right now uh, viewing this from the U.S., imagine, imagine not having Wi-Fi for a day. So imagine not having even electricity for a day or, or water. It's something that I think people in the first world will never understand and hopefully never understand. No one wants to be in that situation. So uh, for sure, Maduro came up with his own theory about that. Uh, he said uh, yeah, it, it, was a, yeah, it was something like a cyber attack, uh, like a conspiracy from the US or something like that. So what's the reality? What happened to the, the electricity companies? There is very simple. First of all, it could not be a cyber attack. We're talking about electricity that, was, that the system was implemented in the 50s and 60s. It's an analogical system. And what happened is what happened with the entire economy. It what happened is with the hospitals. It's what is happening with the high roads because of lack of investment, because of lack of, of management in this case, everything is collapsing. So if you have an electrical system that for 10 years, no one has been paying attention, no one has been investing on that, the system will collapse. As simple as that, the system is collapsing At the same time, at the same way that for some of the oil industry is collapsing, is because exactly that. It's no a cyber attack, it's lack of management, it's lack of investment. Because for sure, if you have politicians running an electricity company, the electricity company will collapse. If you don't have engineers running an oil company, the oil company will collapse. And if you don't have civil society, the private sector involved in this type of development issues, the state and especially a government like the Maduro government will never be able to have an electricity company that will be able to solve uh, our issues. So um, let's go to, the, to April this year. Yeah. Uh, there were big demonstrations again, uh, for sure, after the collapse of the electricity and all that stuff. So yeah. Guaido called for, for new big demonstrations. And we saw um, military, military cars driving into the people. So what can you tell us about that? Well, imagine that there is a, there is a video that, imagine it's a video from a military member running, uh, running over a uh, protester. This in which in which world are we live? In which you have a military member doing that to, to a guy of 20 years old? In, how can you? And then this, I think that exemplifies the situation in Venezuela: is that you have a 90% of people demanding a change, eager for a change, and you have 200, 300 generals trying to stop. It is really a fight between civilians and, and a military member. It is really a fight towards being able to express ourselves. And, and right now we have plenty of cases of demonstrations of Venezuelans on the streets. Because people really believe that, people believe that if, that if they keep protesting, if they keep pushing, there will be a change. And that's something that I, I keep believing, and I think we cannot lose hope. And that's why every time that we have a manifestation, millions of people go to the streets. Is that we will not lose hope. I think we. We may have lost our economy, we may have lost our political system, but something that we will never lose is our hope. And that's why I'm here, and that's why every day I'm working for this, and that's why I'm giving conferences around the world. Because I think every one of us, from our role, from our duty, uh, if we keep doing that, we, we can make a change. And I think a big, big message that I want to give to the international community is that Venezuelans, that we will fight, and we will, be, and we will keep fighting and that we will do everything that we can so we can make a change. And that we, Venezuelans, um, from all over the country, from all over 
the political spectrum, that we are doing everything they can to make a change. And from, from the poorest sectors of Venezuela, they understand that, that socialism is not the answer to a problem. They understand that the way to have a better country is with a liberal democracy. The way to have a better country is, is solving all problems through democracy, through consensus, through union. And, and that's something that I want to say to the international community because I think Venezuela will be an example. Right now it's an example of something horrible, but in the future it will be an example of a country that resurrects from the, from the wars that can happen to a country, from the worst human misery that you can have. I think Venezuela will become the best example of a country that, that got back into its feet. Um, some other bad things we have to talk about. What about, like, uh, we saw videos of people being tortured by the military. What do you know about that? Well, the vast majority of the, of the, vast, the problem is that the vast majority of these videos are members of the military that maybe even be Cubans. So you have, for example, the Sevin, that is, a, that is a, a, the intelligence of, of the police intelligence of Venezuela, that they have tortured, have Frenchmen who have been tortured. And I think the vast majority of the military members, of not, not the generals, but the, the middle military members, are not with the regime, but they're being scared of by these guys as well. We have more than 20,000 Cubans inside the military, for instance, doing surveillance. So I think that's something that we need to say is that it's not that the entire military is with the regime, but they are highly surveillance, and you have a bunch of um, not, uh, Cubans and members of the regime inside the military doing this stuff. In Venezuela right now, we have hundreds of political prisoners that are civilians and hundreds of political prisoners that were former military members. So in Venezuela right now, we have I think almost a thousand former students are right, are right now in prison for political reasons. And that's why in Venezuela, we cannot have fair elections and free elections until we restore rule of law and until we don't have any more political prisoners. Uh, at the last demonstration, we saw people from the military running over to the opposition. Um, how would you, what what could you say about that? How many people are that? So running over. Yeah, running over to the opposition. So said, I'm going to quit my military stuff. I'm going to oh. be with the people. Yes, I mean, we were trying to we were to, we have been trying to find ways to create a legitimate way for them to to escape the horrible prison that the military structure has become because it's really a prison. And the level of surveillance that there is in the military is horrible. So they found this way that by escaping the territory of Venezuela, they will be able to be freed from this prison. And what we are saying at the opposition, what we are saying from, from the leadership of Juan Guaido and the National Assembly, is that everyone that does that will be welcome and there will be amnesty. And if they work with us to make a democratic transition in Venezuela, we will welcome them with open arms. And I think that's something that, that we need to do. Because if we want to rebuild Venezuela, we need to do it from forgiveness, we need to do it welcoming all sectors of society, and we need to do it with peace. And I think and I really believe that if we want to rebuild our country, we need to stop the hatred rhetoric that Chavez bring, bring it to Venezuela. And we start talking about peace, about consensus, about democracy, about resolving our problems through consensus, public discourse, and more and an open society. Mm -hmm. uh, how would you describe the situation right now at the borders, for example, with Colombia and Brazil? Well, the situation right now, you, for example, you talk about migration. Yeah. Well, for example, right now we have uh, Venezuela is the worst migratory crisis uh, since the Syrian refugee crisis. Uh, according to many estimates, more than 5 million Venezuelans have left the country. Uh, for instance, in, in Colombia, we have 1.5 million Venezuelans. So a country like Colombia, I want to say that they have been amazing with us. They have been extremely helpful with us. They have incorporated many Venezuelans into their society in ways that I'm really grateful about. So right now we're trying to find ways so people that are crossing the border massively from Venezuela to Colombia can be reinserted into the labor market in Colombia. Because I mean, according to the UN, to the UN estimates, if Venezuela continues through this uh, humanitarian crisis, more than 8 million Venezuelans will leave by the end of the year. We are talking about one third of the nation leaving the country. The worst humanitarian crisis in the history of our continent. So right now the, the situation with the border, the border is closed um, legally by the, by, the, by the Maduro government to stop humanitarian aid. So people are crossing the border in ways that are, is not even legal. 
or not even uh, secure for them. But people are escaping socialism. People are escaping these policies because they need to feed their families. Uh, doesn't matter if they bring their family with them to Colombia or if they leave their families in Venezuela and they send them food and medicine. Because it's not even sending money. If they send them money, there are no, there are no items, there is no food. So the situation in our border is something that we are we're really tackling. We are finding ways to, to help them to this transition and we are finding ways to, to help Venezuelans incorporate in the labor market of these new countries. Um. I mean, how would you describe the situation right now um, in the society? Because um, we know, for example, in every family is, for example, a guy who supports Chavism or is a Chavista or something like that. Could you even trust your own family anymore or your neighbors? Look, I mean, there are, there are well, in Venezuela, 10 years ago, there were plenty of Chavistas. Right now, there are not, but there, there were plenty, and there are plenty of people that still believe that, that for example, 10 years ago, things were to a good reason. But that doesn't mean they're bad people. And I think that, that those people that believe, for example, that Chavez was the solution to their problems, I think it's our duty and our responsibility to show them that, that, that our policies, that our plan, that, that our perspective is the solution to many of the issues that, that, they, that they saw in Venezuela. It is true that in Latin America, poverty is a big issue, a big, big issue. And we need to tackle that and we need to overcome that. Uh, and, and I think that, that if they believe that for something with more redistribution, if they believe that with more, with more socialism, they could overcome them, we are the ones that want to show them that that is not that way. And, and to that person that has a friend that was or is Chavista, it's not about, it's, it's not about arguing against them. It's about building bridges with them. It's about bringing them to our side. It's about talking to them and explaining to them why the ideas of a free economy, why the ideas of an open society are the ones that will help them. And I think it's all about reconciliation. Uh, I'm 22 years old, Chavez rose to power when I was uh, two or three years old in 1999. And, and for my entire life, I have been living in a country in which the government has a rhetoric against part of society in which the government is, is trying to divide us, in which the government is trying to say that we are no longer brothers, but rather enemies to each other. And, and I believe in exa exactly the contrary of that. I believe in a society that, that, that understands that we are brothers, that we may have difference in ideology, we may have difference in the way or perspective of seeing the world, but we need to respect each other, we need to talk to each other, we need to understand each other. And at the end, with that freedom to talk about the issues, with that tolerance, I think the best public policies, the best institution, and the best type of government will be born from that. I'm a huge believer in this. I'm a huge believer in freedom of speech, in ideological freedom, in rule of law, and in civil liberties. Uh, let's take a look to the future. Uh, would you support an inter intervention, for example, from the US? I mean, right now what we are saying is that all options are on the table because we are already intervened by the Russian military. We are already intervened by the Cubans. But at the same time, we are saying that what we aim for, what we saw the objective, what we saw goal, is that we are able to overcome this problem domestically. With international help, for sure. With financial pressure and with diplomatic pressure towards the Maduro region. But what we are aiming to is that the military, the Venezuelan military, goes to the side of our constitution and start helping us to rebuild our government, start helping us to do this transition government so we can have free and fair elections. That agenda is the only one that will guarantee governability, rule of law, and democracy in Venezuela. But at the same time, as Trump has said, all options are on the table for something to happen in Venezuela. And those people who are opening this option of military interventions is not the opposition, the regime, by committing crimes against humanity, by creating a humanitarian crisis, by allowing terrorist groups to operate in Venezuela, by allowing drug dealing to operate in Venezuela. Those, those, that government, the Maduro government, is the one that is allowing the possibility of the U.S. of doing that. So they are the ones that we should blame if something happens in Venezuela. Because with the opposition, the only thing that we're asking for is we're asking for the opportunity to have free and fair elections. For years we have been asking for this. For years we have been asking to have a true democracy. For years we have been asking to have a democracy in which there is no political prisoners. And, and if we cannot find that peaceful uh, resolution, if we cannot find this peaceful, peaceful transition, 
is because we have Maduro regime that is using a government to do something that we never thought before. That is a government that has alliances with terrorist groups, that is a government that has alliances with drug dealers, and it's a government that is doing everything they can to really, became, to really create a, a, a really a crisis in the entire Western Hemisphere. Because imagine having a failed state in the middle of a continent, that's something that was on in, in Amazon like 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned um, the connection between the government and drug dealers. Um, there are many news which, which, where Venezuela is called the new Colombia. Yeah. What's behind that? I mean, it's even worse. I mean, in Colombia, the drug dealing, in, I mean, in Colombia at the time, the drug dealing was working uh, in despite of the government uh, response to that. So the government was basically not looking to the business. In Venezuela, it's even worse. In Venezuela, the government is running the business. So in Venezuela, it's not that the government is not looking, Venezuela is running the business. Uh, and that, that's not something that Jorge Gerizati is saying. That's something that the State Department has vast evidence on that. And, and that's something that is really, is really worrying for our region. And for Colombia, it should be worrying because Colombia is overcoming many of their historical issues right now. Uh, for example, President Duque in Colombia has said multiple times that, that the, for example, the ELN, the uh, Ejército Liberación Nacional, the guerrillas in Colombia, are operating from Venezuela that they control four states in the border of Venezuela. So for Colombia, under, under their policies towards security, having a country like Venezuela is really difficult. Having a country like Venezuela that has, that has drug dealing, that has terrorist groups, is something that, again, is something that goes beyond our borders. I think the Venezuelan cause is not only a cause of Venezuelans, I think it's becoming a cause of all Latin America because Latin America, if we want to grow as a, as, a, as, a, as a region, all our countries need to be in a position that we can all ex excel. And if we have Venezuela into this tier, into this humanitarian crisis, countries like Colombia, we have, we have a ton of problems. Um, let's talk about the international support of Venezuela. Uh, who are the biggest supporters um, uh, of you and uh, the whole opposition. I mean, for, f to my mind comes, for example, Marco Rubio. Sure. Uh, he's a big supporter. Who else supports uh, your cases? Well, first of all, we need to say that right now we have over 60 governments supporting our cause and, and unofficially declaring Juan Guaido as the president of Venezuela. Uh, so basically the entire international community of the Western Hemisphere is with us. And with that being said, uh, just to mention a few names of people who have been really committing to our cause, uh, for example, uh, from the Organization of American States, Luis Almagro, uh, Marco Rubio has been a big uh, proponent of making a change in Venezuela, Duque in Colombia being a big proponent. And, and that's something that for us he has been really grateful. And we have many Venezuelans in, in many parts of the world asking for that, talking to the politicians, asking them to help us in this fight. And I think that if, if something good came out, came out of the migration, I think it's that. It's that, for example, I mean, yesterday I was giving this lecture here at Maastricht, uh, Maastricht, it's a prior conversation, and there were 20 Venezuelans here in Maastricht. Imagine that. So we have Venezuelans all around the world, and we have people that are helping us from all around the world. Here in the European Union, for example, Tahani has been a, a, good, a, a good leadership here in the European Union. And, and we hope that many more people understand the severity of what is happening in Venezuela and start helping us the way, for example, because again, Luis Almagro has done for years, which is trying to organize international community so we can have a solid coalition of countries. That is something that I have been working on for at least two years. Um, I remember I was in the States at the time, and I saw the opportunity of, of building a coalition. I started talking to people in the States, I started talking to people here in Europe, and I think that's something that we, that we have done. I think it's something that we will continue to do because people like Amaro and Rubio has been great with us. People like Mike Pence and the Trump administration that has been, they have been very good with us. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you see the development, uh, the, 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 yeah, the development in the next months? Uh, like, are there new big demonstrations? What's, what's yes. the road? Yes, I mean, we have a clear, a clear path. We have a clear strategy domestically. We will keep articulating and organizing civil society for political reasons and for social reasons. For political reasons that we need to keep protesting. We need to keep hope 
We need to keep pressuring a change in Venezuela. And socially, we need to keep organizing inside Venezuela so we can start mitigating at least the problems of a humanitarian crisis. Um, I think our job as political activists is to organize and to give hope to those people that see no hope in the future. Many of Venezuelans see that no are no, don't see a solution to this problem. But I think it's our responsibility to help us understand that there will be a solution. And, in, and internationally, uh, we need to keep doing what we are doing. We need to keep organizing the international community. We need to pressure with more sanctions, diplomatic and financial sanctions, build an even bigger coalition of countries supporting us, and build even more uh, awareness about the situation in Venezuela. And, and my prediction will be that in the, in the next month, we will have a free Venezuela, and we're working towards that, and we're working for that. And, and that's something that we're really committed, and that's something that, that can happen any day. Because right now, the only thing that is stopping that is, our, is the Venezuelan military, just mm. to be extremely, extremely direct. For sure, uh, I would wish that for you, and I wish you all the best for that. But if uh, I would give you one free wish okay. for the future of Venezuela, what would you say? A free wish for yeah. the future of Venezuela, that we have a liberal democracy, in which have, we have economic freedom, we have political freedom, and we have civil freedom. With that being said, I want to have a government that do not discriminate for ideology, ethnicity, or religion. I want to have an economy that is free, so people have the right to pursue their dreams. And I want to have a society, again, if this is a free wish, a society that understands that after these 20 years of misery, these 20 years of problems, these 20 years of fighting, a society that understands that only by forgiving, by peace, by cooperation, by unity. Only by doing that we can we can excel as a country and a society that understands that, that that we will do anything that we can so after these 20 years of misery we can have a, a better country tomorrow. It will not be a, a perfect country. It will never be a perfect country. But it will be a country that we feel proud of. That will be my free wish.